A trig function has an angle as its argument and evaluates to a unitless ratio denoting the value of the trig function as we've described in previous videos. So a trig function's inverse would have a unitless ratio as its argument and return the angle having that ratio as its trig function value. Let's do an easy example. The inverse sine of 1 half is pi over 6 radians because the sine of pi over 6 radians is 1 half. A memory trick I used was to substitute the phrase the angle whose in place of the word inverse. So, the angle whose sine is 1 half. These expressions mean exactly the same thing, and the angle whose sine is 1 half is pretty easy to see in your head. Pi over 6. Trig has a special notation that can help alleviate the confusion that comes with using a superscripted negative 1 that might be mistaken for an exponent or index. Putting the word arc in front of the trig function name means the inverse of that trig function. So the arc sign means inverse sign, arc cosine means inverse cosine, and so on. And for the memory trick, use the angle whose in place of arc the angle whose sine is one half. Let's look at a graph of the sine function. Remember our red dot memory aid. Sine intersects the origin. The curve has a compressed theta axis, so I can show more cycles on the curve. So it's still a perfectly good sine wave. The arc sine of one half means the angle whose sine is one half. As it turns out, we have a lot of choices. There are an infinite number of angles whose sine is one half. I'm showing 16 of them right here, but of course they extend infinitely in both directions. But arc sine is supposed to be a function, and functions must return only one value for each argument. So we have a conundrum. Let's graph the inverse of sine. This will be simpler on a graph with uncompressed axes, so I'll redraw the sine curve shown here. The arc sine is the reflection of the sine graph across the line y equals x. Each point on the sine curve has a corresponding point on the arc sine curve. See video TR-22 if you need an inverse function review. Every point on the sine curve, theta comma y, has a reflected point y comma theta. When we reflect every point on the sine curve, we get the inverse sine or arc sine curve. We can see that the domain of arc sine is negative 1 to 1. The arc sine is undefined for arguments outside this range. So, for example, there's no arc sine of 1.2 because there's no angle whose sine is 1.2. Here are some quadrantal angle labels. Inverse trig graphs have theta as the vertical axis since the angle is the dependent variable. Here's a circle with the quadrants labeled and shaded. Quadrant 1 corresponds to this part of the arc sine curve, with angle between 0 and pi over 2 radians. It also represents these larger angles that terminate in quadrant 1. Quadrant 2 angles are shown here. Of course, the pattern continues up and down the vertical axis. Quadrant 3 angles here. I'm showing them on the left negative side of the vertical axis because they correspond to negative sine values, as you can see on the graph and you should know that angles in quadrant 3 have negative sine values, and quadrant 4. The curve fails the vertical line test for a function. We should have expected this when the sine graph itself had so many angles, 16 on the screen, with the same sine. But rather than give up on having an arc sine function, let's limit its range. Can we find a piece of the arc sine function that encompasses the full domain from negative 1 to 1, and passes the vertical line test. Here's a section, 5 pi over 2 to 7 pi over 2. It covers the full domain from negative 1 to positive 1, and it passes the vertical line test. So we could simply define the arc sine function to always return angles from 5 pi over 2 to 7 pi over 2. Well, that's not really a convenient interval. Those angles loop completely around the circle. Let's look for something more expedient. Well, this is better, I guess, but let's find some smaller angles. Keep going. Okay, here, this interval that brackets the zero angle seems handy. 
So we simply define the arcsine function to return negative pi over 2 radians for an input value of negative 1 and pi over 2 radians for an input value of positive 1 and angles in between for arguments between negative 1 and 1. The arcsine function will always return angles in quadrants 1 and 4. Let's look at the arc cosine curve. Its domain is also negative 1 to positive 1, and it has a range of 0 to pi radians, so the arc cosine function will always return angles in quadrants 1 and 2. Let me show the graphs of these functions that you'll see in your textbook. I'll get back to these in a moment, but first I want to show you what I think is a better, easier way to visualize arc sine and arc cosine. We associate sine with the vertical y-axis distances, which are red in this video series. So imagine a red vertical diameter on the y-axis and shade the right half of the circle. Shade the half of the circle that includes quadrant 1. That's the memory rule. To find the arc sine of our example, 1 half, find positive 1 half on the vertical diameter and read across, pi over 6 radians. The angle whose sine is 1 half can become the angle in the proper range whose sine is 1 half, and the proper range of arc sine is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, the angles in quadrants 1 and 4 on the right side of the unit circle. The sine of 5 pi over 6 is also 1 half, but the arc sine of 1 half is not 5 pi over 6, because 5 pi over 6 isn't in the range for arc sine. For any arc sine argument along the y axis, that is from negative 1 to 1, the angle returned is on the right half of the circle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 radians, which corresponds to quadrants 1 and 4. We associate cosine with horizontal blue x-axis distances. So for arc cosine, imagine a blue horizontal diameter on the x-axis and shade the top half of the circle, the half that includes quadrant 1. To find the arc cosine of our example, negative 1 half, find negative 1 half on the horizontal diameter and read straight up to find the angle, 2 pi over 3 radians. For any arc cosine argument along the x-axis from negative 1 to 1, the angle returned is between 0 and pi radians, which corresponds to quadrants 1 and 2, the top half of the circle. As a reminder, for both of these functions, when an argument is outside the range negative 1 to 1, the resulting function value is undefined. The range of the inverse trig functions is the interval that covers the full domain, passes the vertical line test, and includes quadrant 1. Now, let's turn our attention back to the inverse function graphs you'll find in your textbook. These are used in the same way. For arc cosine, we find the argument along the horizontal independent axis and find the corresponding y value denoting the angle. It's no coincidence that this is exactly the logic we'd follow on the sine curve to find the angle associated with the sine value. We simply ignore the other angles having this sine because they're not in the arc sine range. Here's the arc cosine curve from a textbook. It's used the same way. Find the arc cosine argument on the independent axis, then on the curve, look up the corresponding angle on the y axis. This is the same as backing into the angle using the cosine curve over its range of 0 to pi radians. The main idea of inverse trig functions is that we impose artificial but convenient limits on their ranges so that they return exactly one angle for each value in their domain. This has been a long video and there's still one trick to cover, so please watch video TR-23X for a bit more information plus some practice problems.